Why did we grow up in Albuquerque, working after school in her parents' grocery store and the Chicana first generation college graduate? After receiving a PhD degree from Apartment in 1991, Valerie went to UC San Diego where she obtained a PhD in physics education in 2001. She then accepted a faculty position in science education at the University of Colorado Boulder, where she is now. Valerie has had an extraordinarily successful career, and I can only highlight a few things here. She is the co-founder of the International Learning Assistant Alliance, and has advised the National Academy of Science and NASA on issues of science education. She is the author of several physics curricula, and her innovative instructional methods have spread throughout the world. She won many teaching awards, among them the President's Teaching Scholar Award of the University of Colorado System, and she is on the editorial board of scientific journals, among them Physical Review, Physics Education Research. She has received more than an unbelievable $19 million in funding to support physics education, and also leads a software company focusing on student success. Please welcome Professor. It, it truly is an honor to have this opportunity to share this, this special moment with, with you, with the graduates and their families. Um, it certainly was. Oh, it certainly was a special moment for me uh, when I graduated 27 years ago here at UNM. I, I fell in love with physics when I got to UNM. I didn't even know what it was when I stepped foot on the UNM campus. But great professors like Dr. Oluwalia uh, mentored me through the process and um, put me in leadership positions in the Society of Physics Students and nominated me for the Physics Honor Society. I belong. I fell in love with myself through physics. And like one of my students once put it, for the first time, something had my back. Evidence had my back. <laughs> Evidence. Evidence is probably like the most important thing in science. And never before has the American public needed an understanding of the concept more than today. <laughs> what counts? as evidence to support the scientific claim. And how do you tell the difference between a fact and a fake? But evidence is not easy to come by. It is really hard to come by, in fact. Think about it. Gravitational waves were just, we just found enough evidence to support the claim that gravitational waves could be found in reality in our observation two years ago, but we've been looking for them for 50 years, since 1916, when we postulated their existence. It takes a lot of work, and a lot of time, and a lot of people to establish the technology to convince ourselves that we've made an observation, but then to convince our colleagues and to convince the world. Evidence is what science is all about. John Dewey, he was an educational psychologist, and he worked with a physicist named Charles Mann at the University of Chicago in the early 1900s. And he became um, interested in the purpose of education and in science, the purpose of science education more broadly. And he said, in, a, in an article that he published in Science Magazine in, in 1910, he said, does science knowledge mean the body of facts, the subject matter? Or does it mean the process by which something fit to be called knowledge comes in, is brought into existence? The process by which something is fit to be called knowledge is brought into existence. That's where our graduates' expertise lies. They are expert learners, not expert knowers. They're expert learners. They know how to vet claims. They know how to establish whether or not something is fit to be called knowledge. It makes you wonder, why isn't this experience available to every student? Since early elementary school, middle school, high school, why doesn't everybody get to engage in the process of understanding how to make a claim and support it with evidence and decide whether or not the community 
um, buys your argument. Well, make no mistake, we've been trying to do that for a really, really, really long time. Since physics entered the high school curriculum in the mid-1860s, we have been trying to create learning contexts in which all students could have an opportunity to have that experience of, well, watching your claim get supported. Physicists like Edwin Hall, as in the Hall effect, Robert Millikan, as in the oil drop, and uh, Charles Mann, as in the um, new movement among physics teachers, which he ran in 1906. We've been trying to do this since then. Um, needless to say, we have not been fully successful. We do not have a broad scale understanding of how to make decisions about the difference between fact or fake. Even when I was in school in the 1980s, I was in high school, in the early 1980s, and I remember um, my first science class in high school, and, and the teachers would tell me, I know, I know it's awful, it's, but you have to learn this so you can get a good job. <laughs> and I remember thinking, can't I just learn this because it's beautiful? Can't I just learn this because it's vision? And it was then, in high school, here in Albuquerque, that I realized that there might be a little bit of a lack of understanding of, or maybe respect for, the discipline of science and what it might, maybe, have to offer the quality of a human life. And there might be, also, a little bit of a lack of understanding or respect for a human life, like me, and what I maybe, possibly could, have to offer the discipline of science. And it was then that I decided, oh, I'm going to be the leader of the revolution in education. <laughs> um, well, then I'm cute, I still try. <laughs> um, but, but creating these environments in which people can, well, learn to love themselves through science, or learn how to make a claim and look for evidence to support it, building those environments is hard. Because what I've kind of been describing is something that really is truly beautiful, and when we think about preparing our physics teachers, or when we think about teaching physics, you don't always put them in the same sentence. Beauty, physics, I'm making physics. Oh, how beautiful. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so it is, it's been a challenge to implement what our great uh, you know, forefathers, those physicists that I've spoken about already, um, have really been after, and what I'm still after today. Charles Mann, he wrote in Science, he also published an article in Science, this one is in 1914, and he said, the essence of the scientific spirit is an emotional state, an attitude towards life and nature, a great instinctive and intuitive faith. It's because scientists believe in their hearts that the world is harmonious and well-coordinated, and that it is possible to find that coordination if only they work hard enough, honestly enough, and patiently enough. It's that faith inside of them that that inspires them to struggle on year after year over one problem. And, well, that's what science is. It's this engagement, deep, intense, sustained engagement in solving a problem, and that's beautiful. Um, scientists uh, engage in these moments, but uh, there are philosophers who study these moments. So another one of my favorite authors is Mikhail Bakhtin, and he's a philosopher of language and a literary critic, and he studies these moments <laughs> that I'm talking about, that Charles Mann was talking about in that quote. And uh, he published a book called The Philosophy of the Act. And um, the act isn't what you think you're going to do. The act isn't what you thought you did. The act is really what you ended up doing, <laughs> <Sometimes>. <laughs> for better or for worse. <laughs> But that's, that's, that's really these moments that I've been talking about. And, and you know what they are, right? Because some of you, we've all had them. Maybe you were hiking out in the mountains and you, you, know, you had this moment where you couldn't tell the difference between yourself and your surroundings. Maybe you were at the observatory and you were engaging, yeah, engaging with the stars. Um, those are those moments. Or maybe you were just doing a physics homework problem. Six hours went by, it felt like six minutes. You were in it. You were in that moment. Um, you, I want to talk a little bit about moments. You don't know you're in them. In fact, you can't know you're in them or you'll be out of them. As soon as 
<laughs> you start to identify them, you are no longer immersed in the moment. So language is a measurement device. And that's the thing that we use to describe things. So the, the thing about moments, and I say, actually, a moment is being in those moments is the goal of life, is to train ourselves to engage in these moments fully. Again, like I said, you can't really, as much as you want to, describe how beautiful it was in your um, hike in the woods, because as soon as you try to describe it, you destroy it because you've only applied one word to it, language, a measurement device. Um, you, if you're really, really lucky, you might be in the same moment at the same time with another person. The Czech will really talk about it, hey, isn't this great? We're in the same moment. It's more like just appreciating that you are there. And I say, this is the goal in life. As I said, you can't really measure it. You can't really share it later with somebody. The best thing you could do is share who you've become as a result of participating in multiple moments. <coughs> great people are great because they respected themselves enough and the world around them to immerse themselves in where they are not right now and give themselves to what they're doing. Now, besides the beauty of being in a moment, there's something else that the moment has to offer. Um, the moment, when you're in that deep concentration, that sustained uh, moment, you're actually integrating over space and time, collecting information. You don't know you're collecting it because you're in the moment. But when you combine this concept of moment with the other thing I've been talking about, which is evidence, you really end up with according to me, intuition. What is intuition? Intuition is knowing that something's awry. And the only way you know that it's awry is because you've collected so much information over space and time that you know that environment. It's like instinct. The way I describe it, experience is knowing how. Experiencing is knowing now. And intuition is knowing something's up. <laughs> And um, the thing about intuition is that it's really only powerful if you act on it. But that's really hard because I spent the whole first um, part of this talking about evidence, the stuff you can measure, the stuff you have to measure. And I spent the second half talking about the second third <laughs> in talking about uh, the stuff you can't measure and you absolutely shouldn't measure it. But when you put them together, you end up with this thing that you know for sure, and you know you know it for sure, you just don't know how you know it. That's instinct. And if you really have courage, you can act on that instinct. So I'd like to really close out by illustrating what I mean by instinct, and hoping that you will use your, the graduates will use your deep understanding of evidence, your abilities and experience engaging deeply in sustained concentration, to identify these moments of instinct and then having the courage to act on them. The story I want to tell now is about Dan Finley. He's a professor at UNM. He was also here when I was here. And um, he acted on his instinct with respect to me. So here I am. I met him in junior level mechanics. That's the study of motion. And, uh, and oh, I was such a great student. My family taught me that education is a privilege. And it was for me. Oh, I was, I was asking questions in class. One hand was going down, the next hand was going <laughs> up. I, I, was, I was in this office hours. I had questions all written out. I was a great student. But he knew something was up. <laughs> he would say, you got to work in my lab. I'd say, I can't. I got to work at the grocery store 30 hours a week. He said, you got to work in my lab. I said, no can do. I got to work at the state fair. He said, you got to work in my lab. I said, I work 40 hours a week during the summer. So one day he showed up with a form and he said, you have to go to this, you have to fill out this form. And you have to go to this, the summer undergraduate research project in San Diego. I said, summers? I can't go. So then I took it and I put it in my backpack and it got the scrunch on the bottom of the backpack. And that was the last I had seen of that paper. I thought, till one day, I'm walking to class. It was his class. And his administrative assistant said, Valerie, come here. We have to fill out this form. <laughs> there it was, the form. <laughs> she said, I said, I gotta go to class. She said, Dan said you could be late. So I sat down and she helped.
filled out the form and she filled out every answer as she asked me the questions. And then I said, okay, thank you. And I tried to take it. She took it out of my hands. And she said, I'll send it in. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm getting shipped off to San Diego. I have been accepted to the Summer Undergraduate Research Project at the Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and Planetary Science. I have been awarded my moment. I have been given the opportunity to learn about how to determine whether something is fit to be called knowledge and bringing that thing into existence. And well, this was because somebody acted on an intuition. I don't care what, I'm sending this girl to San Diego. You know what? When I, I didn't come back. When I came back, I came back with a PhD in physics education research. And um, I didn't come back. I went straight to the University of Colorado and became a professor. I'm a full professor. I have students who are tenured professors all over the United States in physics departments and in schools of education and abroad. I have, there are, I have so many students that are physics teachers all over the United States in high schools and in some elementary schools. Scientists put intuition to the test. Dan Finley put intuition to the test. And the results? Well, you really, you're looking at them. This, this is what you get if you have the courage to act on a little bit of intuition and give somebody a chance. Sometimes you don't know why, why you're doing it, but you know you must do it. So as you guys move forward and you have these mad skills of observation, you, and now you have enormous power because you have degrees in physics. And that, that's a very, very special thing. And so as you move forward and you, you see what's going on in the world and you're listening to your intuition and making decisions and establishing the courage, I can't even imagine how many lives you will influence. Thank you so much.